Welcome to our discussion of the status of Transjordan. We know that when the Jews were uh, developing the land of Israel in modern times, modern Zionism, Jabotinsky had the idea that both sides of the Jordan were ours, that uh, Israel included the entire, what was then just designated as Palestine, including other side of the Jordan as well. We know today uh, the Jews landed out not uh, taking over most of Transjordan, it's a separate country. It's the country of Jordan today. Except we have the Golan Heights are a little bit uh, beyond the Jordan River on the east on the east bank. So the question is, what is the status of Transjordan? Is it part of Israel or isn't it? Uh, is it something that was really supposed to be part of the treasured land given to the land of it, to the people of Israel, or is it somehow different qualitatively, quantitatively, than the what we call Eretz Canaan, the land? It was promised to our forefathers, land flowing with milk and honey. Is there a difference? So let's uh, begin. I'll share a PowerPoint with you and let's talk about it. So here we go. The Transjordan, what is the status of Transjordan? So uh, in some ways, Israel tried not to capture it. Israel sent messengers uh, to Sihon, the king of the Amorites, uh, who is a Transjordanian uh, kingdom. I want to pass through. We're not going to go into the fields and take things. We're not going to go into the vineyards and steal grapes. We won't even drink your water. We'll walk on the main path until we get to the land of Israel. We're not interested in your, in your land. So it sounds like this land, which Sichon didn't let us pass, did not let us pass through, and we had to conquer it. And then we conquered it, and then it became part of Israel. And the tribe of, of Reuven, God, and eventually the half of Manasseh joined over there. It sounds like we weren't really planning on conquering. It's just that they refused to let us through. So actually, uh, he, he gathered against us, and he fought against Israel, and we, we wiped him out. We uh, conquered his land from our known Diabog uh, to the Bnei Ammon, until Ammon, because the, uh, we don't want to go past the Amon, that's that's Lot, that's our brother Lot. We don't go past it. So we conquered this land. And uh, so the question is, what if they wanted to make peace? What if what if they would have said, sure, pass through, no problem. Pass through, and when, Jordan wouldn't have been part of our land. And then the 12 tribes would have had to divide up the other part of Israel, the part that we own today, and maybe a little bit up north into Lebanon. So the Ramban says as follows. Moshe decided, you know what? I'm going to try to appease him, make him happy, and not, and not fight with him. Because the truth is, eventually it does belong to us. Marie is afterwards, it's the Amorites. And uh, the, as God says, the land of the Amorites, not only the Canaanites, but the Amorites belong to us. And the truth is, peace, it doesn't really mean peace in this context. It would mean that they would work for us and they would uh, be subservient to us. But Moshe knew uh, that they're not going to conquer everything now. There are, ultimately, there are 10 nations we're supposed to conquer. The Girgashi, the Yibusi, Hakanani, Akti, Amri, Vabisi, Vagirashi, and also the Girgashi. There's other... Uh, ROD. There are other, there are 10 nations in total. So we're only going to conquer seven now. So what's the point of doing this one? Let's go to the other side of the Jordan. I'll conquer everything over there. And then everyone will live together. It'll be nice. Be cozy there. After all, that's the good land, flowing with milk and honey. Um, and after all, if, if Reuben and God and the half of Anasha had not, if Reuben and God had not requested to live there, it, we wouldn't have put them there. It would be just a, a land where these people would live. When God says, I'll give it to you, not, that's not the very idea. The, the, the Transjordan was not given to us. You took it yourselves. We decided to take it. Also, uh, when the, we, the Mishnah speaks in Caleb about the 10 levels of, pure, of, of holiness, Jordan, as we'll see later, the other side of the Jordan, Transjordan, is not is not part of that. 
because it's not worthy of having the Beit HaMikdash. The Beit HaMikdash could have been different places in, in modern day Israel, but it could not be in Transjordan. It's not worthy of the uh, divine presence. Um, and we'll see that there's a verse uh, to this effect uh, as well in the book of Joshua. So, uh, so, so now what, what happened? We did conquer Sichon and we took those lands. We, we dwelt there and, um, and we, we began to settle there. So we actually sent spies, we conquered certain areas. Um, and then we, we went out and O came to attack us. So then we had to fight him and said, God said, don't worry. And we, we indeed conquered him, but what if he didn't attack? So then maybe the Ramban might argue that we just would have passed through. We wouldn't have paid any attention to this. One day we would conquer it. The idea was first you conquer the main part of Israel, then some expansion later on you might conquer the other part. Now, after the tribes do make a deal that they would, the Reuben God would go fight with the Jews on in the what we call Israel today, and then they would come back to Transjordan and settle there. So then Moshe says, "Okay, fine, I give it to you. You can you can have it." Moshe gave part of the Gilad to this person. Yair ben Menashe took some of the outer uh, areas. They called him Chavod Yair. And Novach went and he, he took some other city at Knat and they called it Novach. So um, Moshe seems to give it to them. And, um, and the question is, what is the nature of this deal? Why does it have to be that Moshe, Moshe and, and Reuben and God made the deal that is, it says, if Reuben and God will come to fight over there in Israel, then they can have the Gilead, they can have Gilad uh, on this side, on the Transjordan afterwards. But if not, then they have to dwell in, in Canaan. I think it's, it's this idea that you have to first conquer the left bank. And when you conquer the left bank, then the sanctity of the east bank uh, comes into play. For instance, the rabbis say that, let's say, did they have to bring tithing from the uh, the, the land of Reuven and God. No. First, they had to conquer the regular Israel proper. And then once they conquered that, then the sanctity button goes off in Transjordan and it becomes holy only then. So that's why they can only conquer it. They can only really settle it once they've conquered the rest of Israel. It's an annex. The annex can't come before the, the land itself. This is an interesting question. If the Transjordan is part of Israel in any sort of way. And what was the big deal that Moshe was punished? He didn't go to take the Jews into Israel. What do you mean? He was in Israel. He conquered Sichon and Og. He did a great job. He conquered part of Israel and Joshua conquered the other part. That's not the impression we get. We always say that Moshe didn't get into Israel, right? Um, um, so why did he want to go there? What's going on? So uh, after all, we know that uh, Hashem says to Moshe and Aaron, you didn't believe in me and you, you didn't uh, show my faith to others and you didn't sanctify my name. You're not going to bring them into the land which I gave them. So apparently this land is not given to them. The land where they are right now, which they already conquered, that's not the land that God gave us. And uh, why did Moshe even think that he could even ask God to go to Israel. God told me he can't go to Israel. So then why did he, why did he ask in Deuteronomy? He says, oh, please, I want to go to the other side of the Jordan. Why? So Rashi says, well, after he subdued the land of Sichon and Og, he thought perhaps the vow that I should not enter the land was annulled since this was part of the land of, uh, of Canaan. Uh, so he thought, well, I already, I was ready. You said I wasn't coming to Israel, but I already conquered Sichon and Og, so I guess I did come to Israel. I did come to Israel. Then let me continue to be in Israel. So that's the question. Uh, that's, so, uh, so it seems that even Moshe was thinking that maybe I am in Israel already. If I'm already in Israel, then I can go to the other part of Israel. Well, what's the answer? No. The part of Israel you're in doesn't count. What you're not going to go to, that's the land of Israel, is the land that Moshe did not get to see. He saw it, but he didn't get to go. To. Now, if if the Transjordan was was uh, was part of Israel, then all the laws of tithing and, and gifts to the poor and uh, gifts to the temple and the Kohen, they would all apply. They would all apply 
in uh, the Transjordan. So let's see, we look in the first chapter of Bikurim, the, chap- the tractate Mishnah that talks about first fruits. It says, well, Elu Mavim the Korim. These are people who could really bring the fruits properly in the full, full blast. At a certain, you have to bring it during summer. It has to be from the seven species that Israel is blessed with, wheat, barley, and uh, also uh, pomegranates and olives and dates and figs, the things that Israel is blessed with. Uh, they can be, um, now, Maver Ayardane, however, when it comes to the Transjordan, Transjordanian fruit, Rabbi Yossi Aglili says, He says, no. If it's from the Transjordan, you can't bring first fruits. Now, there's a certain holiness lacking. Even after they conquered Israel proper, the Transjordan lacks a certain holiness. So uh, it's not Zavat Chalavudvash. It's not flowing with milk and honey. How does he know that? It's interesting. We'll, we'll see later. Now, the commentary of Ravadya Bartanur, the famous commentary on the Mishnah, he says, uh, The first op- opinion is, you could bring fruits from the uh, Transjordan. Because I clearly disagree. Even though it's not Zavat Chalavudvash, everyone admits it's not described as flowing milk and honey, but Kavish and Yenna, Baruch Israel. Since God gave it to Israel, we call it the land which the farmer says, thank you, God, for the land which you gave me. He did. Well, Paul said, like, literally, says, no. We can't bring from, from Transjordan. Why? We'll find that later. However, we don't agree with Yosef. So it seems that the class is over. We say that every yard in Transjordan is good enough for Bikurim. It's, it's a holy land. Okay. But we're not quite done yet. If we look at Exodus, Hashem says to, to Moshe at the burning bush, he says, I'm going down to save them from the Egyptian hands and to take them from that land of Egypt, El Eres a little beautiful land, a land flowing with milk and honey. He lists the one, two, three, four, five, six, six nations, really seven. But um, he says he's taking them to this good land. And wherever they're going to be going, that's, that's really uh, the land flowing with milk and honey, not the uh, Transjordan. It's the place where they're going to. That's flowing with milk and honey. That's the place of the Canaanites. You see Fra on Leviticus talking about the Omer, another mitzvah that we have to do is to wave the Omer on Pesach. So when you come to Israel, you have to do that law. When you come to Israel, what does that mean? The land. Maybe when the time they get to Transjordan, that's good enough. They should bring the the uh, the Omer offering. No, says the Midrash. The Sifra. In the special land. What about Ammon and Moab? No, that's not your land altogether. The, the Ammonite and the Moabite lands, those are not ours altogether. So there is an idea that when you come to Israel, that does not mean when Moses went to Sichon and Og, Transjordan, that's not coming to Israel in terms of the kicking in all the laws of the holiness of the land of Israel. Is it holy like Israel? Well, it says there are 10 levels of sanctity. The land of Israel is holier than all other lands. What's the holiness? Because you could bring the Omer, which we just talked about, and the Bikurim, which we just talked about, but you can't bring it from other lands. Well, according to those who say you can't bring Bikurim, from Israel, going to really, and I guess it's not doesn't have the holiness of the land of Israel. The Re Colon uh, quoted in the Marshal, and he says as follows: The Rambam writes, Smag agrees that we didn't do bring Bikurim from a rabbinic perspective. That the rabbi said, yeah, you could you could bring a Bikurim, the first fruits from Transjordan, but regarding Trumus and Maizros. Um, they didn't say anything. Uh, the Ramam doesn't say anything about whether you could bring uh, Truma, Maser, the other tithings, doesn't say. So, um, so that would sound like maybe other fruits, um, you know, have the full sanctity, though the full laws of the, of the other laws of Truma, Maser, giving things to the 
Cohen, the Levy, those things do apply even in Transjordan. But then he quotes the the uh, the Mishnah Mikurim, and um, and Rabbi Yosef Gulu says we don't bring uh, from Jordan, Transjordan, but the rabbis say you do. So what do they say? Well, why, why can you bring from Transjordan? Because it's only rabbinically speaking. Uh, they, they didn't really mean they weren't serious. They didn't mean that you could really bring uh, uh, Korean first fruits from Transjordan. They meant rabbinically you could. According to Torah law, they agree that it's exempt, that it's not land flowing with milk and honey. And however, Truma and Maser, other tithings, have nothing to do with flowing with milk and honey. It's only on, on Bikurim we have to thank God for giving you the land flowing with milk and honey. That's where it has to come from Transjordan. It's only rabbinic if it's not, only rabbinic law if it's not. But in terms of, in terms of, of Bikurim and of, uh, of Truma and Maser, it doesn't make a difference. The Jerusalem Talmud uh, says that um, in Bikurim, they, they say, it has to be the land that, you, that God gave you, not that you took by yourself, not that you took by yourself. Here's the full Yushami. I uh, will see. Well, also talks about this. What about the Jordan itself? Forget about Transjordan. What about the Jordan River? When you're in the Jordan River, are you in Israel or are you outside of Israel? You cross the border. So, Sure, Israel and Transjordan have a, you know, different agreements about, about the Jordan River itself and who does it belong to. So they say it's, it's, a, it's an earlier debate between the rabbis, Tanaim. You're coming, you're crossing the Jordan, the land of Canaan. Eretz Canaan, below Eretz Canaan, Eretz Canaan. First opinion is that when you get past the Jordan, then you're in Israel. But until then, you're not in Israel. It's not the land of Canaan, which, strangely enough, it's the land of Canaan that's holy. Uh, that's what Rabbi Yehuda ben Matera, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, famous Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, he says, that the other side of the Jordan to east, just like the Jer- Jericho um, is part of the land of Israel, so too the Jordan is part of the land of Israel. So there's a, there's a debate about the, the, um, the Jordan, whether the Jordan is part of Israel or not. I don't know whether we'd follow Rabbi Yehuda ben Matera versus Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. But uh, they all agree that it's not, that beyond that is not the land of Canaan. The Jerusalem Talmud in Chala says as follows, Eat tanay tanay. Some early authorities say, Yardin Me'eret Yisrael, that the, uh, the Jordan River, or perhaps it means the other side of the Jordan, is part of Israel, and some say it's not. Google that's smoke. Some say, um, so, uh, so in any event, uh, there, there, some quote this, perhaps as an idea that there's a debate about Transjordan, or maybe this is just a debate about the, the Jordan River. So then they quote that, they go back to that verse in Exodus 3, and one of the rabbis says, wait a second, wait a second. You're saying only parts of Israel are, uh, are flowing with milk and honey. What are you talking about? I, it says God took them out of Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey. So it's all milk and honey. I'm alone. I share ba, the, no, he says, only parts of Israel are flowing with milk and honey. Not all of them. And also when we say that the first fruits are that, uh, we, the man who brings the first fruits says, thank you for giving me the land that you gave me, but not the land, says the Jerusalem Talmud, that I took for myself. So the, the Transjordan, they took it themselves. But God did not give it to us. So it's a very interesting distinction. Um, so if it's a matter of flowing milk and honey, uh, it's not flowing milk and honey on the other side of the Jordan. But if it's a matter of, uh, of, uh, of if he gave it to me, well, he gave it, he did it. The Transjordan is not given to you. They took it yourself. The Tashbits uh, says that, um, that everybody agrees that the Avery Yardin is not from Canaan. See, uh, Rabbi Maidan also made this point that there's something called Eretz Canaan, Rabbi Yolbinun, something called Eretz Canaan, and the, the Transjordan is not Eretz Canaan, it's not the Canaanite land. And that's what God was promised us was the Canaanite land. If you look in uh, Genesis, there's a description of the borders of Canaan, 
and it doesn't include Transjordan. Um, so that's just a question of what, what's called Kana. Um, but as far as the mitzvot of the land of Israel, um, unless it says that that mitzvah has to have flowing milk and honey, like the Bikurim, then it's part of Israel. So for other laws like tithing, there's nothing wrong with the Transjordan. Uh, it may not be Eretz Canaan, it may not be flowing with milk and honey, but it may have other qualities which make it obligated in the mitzvahs of the land of Israel. And after all, what is the land of Israel? The land of Israel is a place that has extra mitzvahs. The question is, are all the mitzvahs applicable? If some of them are not applicable, maybe that shows less of a holiness. Now some uh, counterindications that indeed the, the Transjordan is lacking quite a bit. Yaakov Ruveni is, uh, is a sort of a Kabbalistic sort of medieval uh, compilation. And he says, uh, He says, you, 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 we don't bring Bikurim uh, from outside of Israel. Because outside of Israel has certain satanic elements. And what are the rabbis arguing about whether the Transjordan uh, could be brought, the, the, the fruits of Transjordan? Because that's the question. In a called Kachsid Transjordan, it's not completely in the realm of the holy. It's a little bit in the realm of the satanic realm. Says an interesting thing. He says, we know that in all of Israel, they only had three um, centers of refuge for those who killed someone by mistake. In Transjordan, which is a smaller area, they also have three. He says, what's the problem? Because it's the Fishi Rotsky. There are a lot, of, a lot of murderers over there. So there's something unholy about the land of the Transjordan. In Joshua, in fact, it says it explicitly. Joshua 22, verse 19. Even though it's Even though it's it's an unclean land, you'll come over here, you'll help us over there, and then you can go back over there to the Transjordan, talking about the tribe of Reuben and God, and half of Anasha. They can go back, but first they, they have to come to Canaan, then they can go back, even though it's not, it's not holy. Rashi says, it's impure, it's the Holy One, blessed be he, did not choose to rest his presence there. God did not choose to put his Shekhinah, his divine presence, in Transjordan. So some very serious damnations of the Transjordan land. The Ram and the laws of Bikurim says that what? It's a rabbinic law to bring to bring um, to bring Bikurim from the land of Sichon and Og. And some want to say, since he says there's Eretz Israel, there's a land of Sichon and Og. Ramam is telling us that Sichon and Og, the, the areas that Reuben and God conquered, the Jews conquered, and, the, and Reuben and God and the half of Manasseh settled, not part of what's known as Eretz Israel. The Birki Yosef Rabbi Azulai, actually in an essay about Pesach and the Omer, he goes off in a whole long discussion about the Transjordan. And he says, you know, someone wanted to argue that uh, everybody agrees that it's part of the Eretz Israel, that Kulu is the Eretz Israel, that the Transjordan is part of Israel. He says, what are you talking about? The, um, you have a bright time, you have a, a debate in Chala, in, in Chala 4 4, that uh, some people say, that the Jordan is Israel, and some say it's not. Even if they're arguing about the, uh, the river, they're certainly arguing about Transjordan. So it's not so simple. The Rambam in his commentary to the Mishnah in Bikurim says, According to the rabbis who said that you could bring Bikurim from, from uh, Transjordan, he says, it's true, it's not flowing with milk and honey, but God gave it to us. So you can say God gave it to us. Thank you, God, for the fruit that you get from the land that God gave us. And we don't agree with Rabbi Yossi. We don't think that the Transjordan is removed from this ability to say that God gave it to us. However, in the Jerusalem Talmud, we saw an opinion that, that no, that God um, did not give it to us. We took it ourselves. But finally, Rav Cook has a very fascinating essay here, and I wanted to share that with you. Uh, it's from Shmuot Haria uh, in Parsha Tazria, and um, 
it says that uh, Reuven and God said, you know, please let us, don't take us over the Jordan. We also find that Naaman was a leper. He was, he lived in, uh, in Aram and up north, an enemy general, and he had leprosy. So he came to the prophet Elisha and he told him to dunk himself in the Jordan. So he says, he says, I know there's only God in Israel. When did he realize that? When he, when he went in the Jordan, he realized that. Why? Because the Jordan, according to Rehkuk, uh, it's a debatable point, uh, Jordan is part of Israel. And so it was being part of that border of Israel, that's what gave him uh, this special miracle that he was saved from his leprosy. Now, it's true that the place where this general came from was Syria. And biblical Talmudic Syria, and David conquered that area. Um, but the holiness of Israel on our side of the Jordan, on the west, the the, the, the left bank, is much greater. But the standing and the status of the Transjordan is particularly uh, unusual. After all, one day, the, the Israel will be like the whole world. I'm not sure what he means. Does he mean that the whole world will be like Israel or Israel will be like the whole world? And Israel, even though we went into Golos, even though we're in exile, or we're living here in Memphis, a Jew has the holiness of the, of the land of Israel. This is an idea that I was told by my father of blessed memory that the... Um, uh, Shetlach, when the Jews lived in sort of different, different little uh, villages in, in Poland and Russia, so uh, very often the Hasidic rabbis would come and say that they had the Kedusha Seretz Yisrael. People felt like they had the, the holiness of the land of Israel. Even Rav Kook, who's such a big Zionist, he says wherever a Jew is, he brings with him the holiness of Israel. Because when we pray through Israel, I turn my, my face toward Jerusalem, toward east, and in that sense, I'm, I'm turning myself toward Israel. And uh, so wherever I am, I'm connected to Israel. And, uh, and therefore, we have this beautiful influence on wherever we live, that we give it some of the holiness of Israel. Where did this idea come from, mystically speaking? Where did this idea come from that you could bring part of the holiness of Israel to outside of Israel? Through the Eber Yardin. Eber Yardin, HaMachaber, Studios of Israel, and Chutz Lawrence. You see, there needed to be this middle ground between the holiness of Israel and the profanity of the land, the other lands of the world, the rest of the world. But what the bridge between the two is the Ever Yardin. Ever Yardin shows that you can take a part that's, I don't know, was it supposed to be part of Israel? Wasn't it supposed to be part of Israel? We don't know. And you could bridge the gap between the holiness, the holy and the unholy. Um, this middle ground of of the Transjordan between Israel and outside of Israel is bridged by this area. Elisha told him, go in the Jordan, because the Jordan will connect you with the holiness of the land of Israel, and you'll be able to take it with you outside of Israel. So too, that every Jew has a, an ability to bring their holiness, their ideas, our values, our ideals, the Abrahamic ideas to the rest of the world. It's all because of this. This was the beginning where Transjordan was transformed into Israel. That gave a possibility that all the world could be given the holiness of Israel. And that's what converts. Converts also are to show that there's a bridge between the Gentile and the Jew to bring the holiness from the Jew all the way into the rest of the world. So, so it's an interesting question, question of the Transjordan. You know, is it part of Israel? Is it not part of Israel? We saw some rabbis who said it was. We saw some rabbis who said it wasn't. We saw some rabbis who said, well, it's not, it's not Canaan, but it's Eretz Israel, Or it's not Eretz Israel, but it's the land that God gave us. Or it's not the land that God gave us, but it's the land which we took. Uh, or that once you conquer the other side, then you can make an annex to the, the Holy Land on the other side. Uh, and we saw the idea that maybe there's something not so holy about it. There's something wrong with it. 
it's a place where those who live there are, have bad influence. They become uh, influence in the realm of of, uh, of Rotskim. Sometimes they become murdered. Um, and that somehow it's called, in the book of Joshua, Eretz Tamiyah, it's, it's an unholy land. But ultimately, it was important. It was an important venture for Reuven and God and half of Manasseh to go out there and, and connect the land of Israel idea with something that was a little bit of, a, of outside of Israel, a little bit of a chutzlar, a little bit of a diaspora, the exile. And by connecting the two, it gave hope to the rest of the world that we could bring this radiant Kedusha from the land of Israel, and it could migrate and, and uh, influence all over the world. So this is the idea of Transjordan. This is the idea of a bridge between uh, the holiness of the land of Israel and the rest of the world. Let us hope that we can bring this Transjordanian holiness, that middle kind of holiness, with us wherever we go. And that uh, through that, we can indeed sanctify everything around us. So ultimately, Malar Tveyas Hashem says in Isaiah, one day, for the, all the world will be filled with the knowledge of God. Thank you for joining us here at the Anshay Sfar by the Lamed Congregation for a discussion of the Ivar Yardin, the Transjordan. Join us each week for a discussion of the Parsha and the various holidays. And, and uh, thanks to Jason Lefkowitz, who always records for us. Thank you.